Yona Potts. Thank you, Stefan. I, I appreciate this oh. opportunity to be here with you. And to, I also want to thank all the organizers from for this wonderful uh, event. It's my first time in Budapest. And so far, I'm having a great experience. What I want to talk to you about is the future of robots and what this means for, for us, for, for humans. So before we talk about the future, though, I want to go back to the past. And we have to thank Central Europe for the very word robot. As most of you know, it was coined by Carol Chapek in 1920 as part of a play. And it's not completely surprising in some sense that the idea of robots originated here in Central Europe because this is a place where cultures clash. Different cultures come together at this crossroads. And robots do represent a certain kind of culture. We might think of them as, as immigrants from the future. There's something unknown, something other, something that's never quite completely understood, something that's always foreign about robots. And I think they, they represent a very powerful metaphor for us to understand ourselves. Now let's go back to 1993. I was, I was a young, young professor at the University of Southern California and was just starting a robotics lab there. And my students came and told me about this amazing new thing called the World Wide Web. And um, we all got very excited about it. We started thinking, how could we contribute? And we started thinking maybe we could um, do something with robots. And so we started thinking, what would we do? We had a robot in the lab. We thought about how we could connect it. And then we came across this. We wanted to really do something that would be kind of provocative and raise some new questions. And so we came up with the idea of having um, the people over the web control a robot that would be tending a garden. And we called this the telegarden. And here's the idea. You had a, um, a planter with about 11 foot diameter, what is that, about three meters of... Um, of, of soil, and uh, it was filled with living plants, but then people could come in over the web and access this from anywhere in the world. And then you could, you could click on the screen, and that, there was a camera at the end of the robot arm, and by clicking on the screen, you could move the camera and the robot around and visit the garden. And then if you, if you registered, we'd send you a password, and then you could participate by also helping to water the garden. And then if you watered for a certain amount of time, we give you a seed to plant. So in this way, people, it was a collective experience in, in, in basically sharing a common agricultural, um, ag agricultural zone. And for any of you who are real gardeners, um, you know that when you set out to do something like this and you invite people over the internet, well, um, after you get about 10,000 or so participants, um, it quickly turns into kind of a a more of an exercise in the tragedy of the commons. Um, so we, we, it was, there were a lot of things we didn't expect that came out of this experiment um, slash art installation. It was up, by the way, for nine years. But one of the things that came out was a question from a student um, who wrote to me over, the, over email and said, well, how do I know that there is a real garden there? And this was a surprise because we were working on the garden. We were dealing with the plumbing and fighting aphid infestations and things like that. So it didn't, I never thought about that. But the more I, I did, I couldn't come up with a good answer for him. It's actually a very hard question. And it's a very old question. In other words, what is the difference between virtual reality, where something might be fictional but look real, and distal reality? when something is real but just distant from you and somehow mediated. And I think this, this distinction between these two categories is actually getting even more blurred today with the advances with Oculus Rift and other technologies in VR. So at that time, though, we wrote a book. I, I worked with uh, six philosophers, six engineers, and six artists. And we came up with this book. We came up with a term um, telepistemology that uh, never caught on. Um, but the idea was to think about what is knowledge at a distance. 
what is the status of things that you would experience, say, over the internet, but yet you couldn't, you couldn't know for sure if they were real or not. Now let's fast forward to this year, and the field of robotics has advanced enormously. You know that there's been great progress. Google is now pioneering work in the self-driving vehicles, and they've actually made a quite a bit of progress. In fact, these cars are now at the stage where they're actually better than human drivers, at least drivers that might be very sleepy or intoxicated or checking their messages on, on Instagram. But we'll know that these robots are truly autonomous when we instruct them to go to work and they decide instead to go to the beach. Now we're not there yet, but the thing that's, um, in, that these two systems have in common, namely the, the, the in a number of ways. Now, as you know, there's been an enormous amount of progress with robots. We now see them in surgery. There's over 3,000 surgical robots being used around the world, many more on the way. They're being used in defense, and many governments are using them, to, developing them for defense applications, and in the home. So there's now estimated to be about uh, 10 million robots doing things like vacuuming um, and sweeping around the house and entertaining cats. Now, but we still don't have really robots doing things that are productive in our house, like cleaning up. And why is this? It's because of something that Moravec, Hans Moravec, observed over 30 years ago, and he called Moravec's paradox. And it's the idea that robots, that things that are actually very hard for humans, like spot welding, are very easy for robots. But things that are easy for humans, like cleaning up a dinner table, are actually very hard for robots. So I'll describe what I mean by this in terms of what the cloud can do is changing this paradigm in terms of four aspects. And the first has to do with this idea of a robot in your home. So right now robots can, can sweep. They're, they're pretty, um, pretty good at that, but they, they're not good at putting things away, really cleaning up around the house. And the idea is that this is a problem because they're always encountering things and they're not sure what to do with them. But the cloud can provide a great, a great resource for this because almost every object that you would encounter in a house, there's data about that object available on the cloud. So there's, in fact, almost every, everything that you can encounter, there's information that you can gather that wouldn't be able to be stored on the robot or carried on the robot's memory, but you can get access to in the cloud. So that is the first aspect is big data. This is changing the field. In other words, we're really thinking about robots differently, not having robots that have to be programmed with that information, but that information is now accessible on demand. The second aspect has to do with this problem of cleaning up, um, cleaning up the after a dinner party. Now, if you put yourself in the position of being a robot, the world is very noisy and imprecise. Your sensors are imperfect. Your actuators are imperfect. Actually, trying to manipulate the, the physical world is extremely difficult. Now, the central issue then is uncertainty. Robots are constantly dealing with physical uncertainty in their environments, and they arise from a variety of sources. The, uh, this kind of uncertainty, though, can be modeled very effectively with statistical techniques, with probability distributions, but unfortunately, the kind of distributions that you encounter are not nice, mon uh, nice Gaussian distributions, but multimodal distributions that look kind of like this. So um, there are techniques that allow us to, to handle those, but they're numerical. That means that we can't just use nice analytic results, but we have to model these with lots and lots of data. And if we go back to this example of the dinner table, if we consider probability distributions, modeling all the different objects or things that we might encounter on that dinner table, we would then have to combine these probability distributions, the uncertainty that arises from all of that, these different distributions together. And this requires an enormous amount of number crunching. The, the, it was essentially considered intractable. 
for robots to be able to perform operations that are sometimes called Markov, partially observed Markov decision processes, were never considered practical for robotics because they were just too demanding computationally. But this is now possible with cloud computing. So if we have the idea of accessing clusters of computing on demand, we can then solve problems that we couldn't solve before. We can solve them to, to find an optimal strategies or policies for the robot that are capable of accounting for, anticipating and accounting for this kind of uncertainty. So the second aspect, if you will, for cloud robotics is cloud computing. The third one is, let, I'll, I'll describe by going, telling you a quick story about Africa. I was born in Africa in 1961. My parents were there teaching. And I recently went back to, to Central Africa and found students there who were, were working with robots, were, were, were excited about robots as a way to get inspired about science, technology, engineering, and math, the same way students do here and all over the world. But the problem was that the robots that are available the, the kind of educational robots are very expensive. They cost on the order of $300. Now it's not unaffordable for some kids, but it is for most of the kids in this world. So I met a, a professor there, and she and I came up with a concept of something we called AFRON, the African Robotics Network. And so we formed this on the internet. We invited friends and friends of friends to join this. We now have about 400 people worldwide and we launched a competition to design an ultra affordable robot for education. The idea was could we replace this, um, the Lego Mindstorms, with something that was much, much less expensive? And we set a target that we thought was kind of unattainable, but we thought it would be worth trying was $10. So could someone design a $10 robot for education? So we put that out there and we got. We got applicants from all over the world with interesting designs. And they were very clever, actually. We had some that were cardboard made with zip ties, cost about $70 or so, different kinds of plastic components, et cetera. And the, but the top idea, the very best idea that won the prize, was an inventor in Thailand. And he had experience taking apart old Sony game controllers. And so, he took one apart and he opened it up and the two vibratory motors he basically modified to drive two wheels. So this robot could drive itself around. And then he wanted to make use of the thumb switches at the top so that it would detect contact. So when it would bump into something, the thumb switches would move. And he, um, so he was thinking about, he needed a moment arm, some kind of levers for that. And he was thinking about what to use and he came up with this, two lollipops. So that was the, the birth of the lollipops. And um, all the details for making your own lollibot are on the web, if you search for it. And what's amazing is that the entire bill of goods for this to make a lollibot, because you can get these game controllers surplus for about $3, the entire lollibot costs $8.96. Now, this is, the reason I tell you this story is that it's an example of the third aspect of the cloud, which is that there's an, it can tap into this vast ocean of ingenuity that's out there. And this idea of open source, of sharing data, sor source code, and designs. This is changing the field dramatically. And the last uh, example comes from this clip from the Matrix. Okay, we'll start it up again. Let me just play it. He okay. said, There you go. Hurry. Let's go. But that's actually the, the other idea, which is that robots can start sharing information and downloading software on demand. In other words, if a robot doesn't know how to do something, it, can, it doesn't need to carry all that, that software, all that programming on board. It can be constantly updated in the cloud. 
And this is happening at places like Amazon warehouses, where all these robots are moving around delivering um, items to, to be packed, and they're constantly exchanging information and programs about changes in the floor conditions, etc. So these four aspects are all very, very important for the field. They're changing the way we think about robots now. Big data, cloud computing, open source, and robot learning. Now in the time I have left, I'm going to um, describe very quickly two examples of this kind of, of the work that we're doing at, uh, at Berkeley, but there's work going on all over the world. And this is, um, this is the ideal that we mentioned earlier of the robot that would pick up and clean up the house while you're gone. I think most of us need one of these. Um, but the, the problem is that this, this video, which uh, went out several years ago, was very carefully constructed and programmed by, by humans. It doesn't exist yet. And the problems are that the manipulation is very hard, as I mentioned. So let's just imagine you want to pick up one thing. There's something out there, and you detect it with your sensors. The real object that's there may be anything, any one of these that I'm showing here. It could be a, a, a hundred thousands of different objects, because you just don't sense it precisely. So the way we can treat this with, with statistical probability is by making probability, by treating this as a probability distribution. So any one shape is a, is a sample from this distribution. So we put Gaussian distributions around each of the vertices and about the center of mass. And that's a way of defining a probability distribution. And then we're going to sample from that to determine what would be an optimal grasp. So what I want to do is think about for each possible grasp of that object, how would that object respond under all those different possible perturbations? And so we can formalize this. In fact, for a given sample, we could quickly compute the response of the object, whether it's going to be stable or not. And then what we want to do is compute this for hundreds or thousands of different options. And we can, what we want to be able to compute is this whisker diagram you see here, where the length of each whisker is proportional to the probability that the grasp will be successful. So that algorithm actually is very nicely parallelizable. We can compute all the different, we run the statistics for very many different possibilities in parallel in the cloud. So this lends itself nicely to cloud robotics. And we can generate results like this. And some of them, we don't have time to go into detail, but some of them are very counterintuitive, that the result, the best grasp, is not what might be obvious to us. Because again, we have a hard time doing that kind of statistics in our head. So there are papers about this online. And then I want to I give you one last example, which has to do with, with robot-assisted surgery. And I want to note that we're not talking about replacing surgeons. Okay, surgeons are always going to be needed, in my opinion. But we, there are some new developments that can allow us to assist surgeons in the same way that we have developments that allow us to assist drivers, just like automated parking. So some things that are tedious, we want to be able to help surgeons with. So this is a new result that we just, we just published or just presented about three weeks ago at a robotics conference. We are investigating if a Da Vinci surgical robot can autonomously perform tedious subtasks. This video demonstrates new results involving cutting and deformable tissues using a learning by observation approach described in detail in the paper. The first subtask is linear debridement, removing a linear section of cancerous tissue. We use plastic putty as tissue phantom. A computer vision system identifies the linear section and guides the robot to extract it in subsections. In five trials, the robot successfully extracted all target tissue in pink. The next subtask is spherical debridement, removing a set of randomly placed spherical sections of cancerous tissue. We use plastic putty as a proxy for healthy tissue. Embedded in the healthy tissue are multiple targets made of the viscoelastic material shown in pink. These targets represent damaged or tumorous tissue. A computer vision system identifies the target spheres and guides the robot to extract them. In 50 trials, the robot achieved a 96% success rate. This subtask is from a laparoscopic surgeon's training kit, cutting a circular pattern from a sheet of gauze. A computer vision system identifies the circle and guides the robot to cut along the lower and upper halves. The second gripper stretches the gauze, while the first gripper cuts the pattern. In 20 trials, the robot achieved a 70% success rate with a 99.89% cutting accuracy in successful trials. The video is sped up by a factor of 8. 
The robot is currently half as fast as human experts. However, not all trials were successful. We show here failure modes of this subtask. We are working to improve robustness for future work. Okay, so don't worry, we're not going to perform that on anyone that soon, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the kind of things that we're working on. That the, very similarly, the learning from demonstrations that we're showing here is also, is also facilitated by using cloud computing and cloud memory. So these are the these are the four advantages of this new paradigm, and I want to say that there's also it's very important to recognize that there's some major issues that this idea brings up. One is that if we if we think about using the the network, we're going to also have to deal with all the problems that networks have, like delays, like the quality of service isn't always there. The network goes down sometimes. That's one. But the second has to do with, and I think this is a very very profound problem, which is what about the privacy implications? Or what about the security implications? So if you have a robot, a cloud robot in your home, it might be possible for someone to hack into that robot and then while you're at work, go over and basically pick up all the valuables, drop them at the front door, and then unlock the front door. Uh, so we have to be aware that there's, there's these risks, there's these um, real dangers that go along with opening up this uh, Pandora's box of cloud robotics. And there aren't any good answers for this right now. I think it's really important to, to, to go in with our eyes open. Now I think a lot about these things in regard to what is it going to mean for the future for us as humans. This is my daughter, Odessa. She's, um, she's 12 now. She likes robots. But um, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, this idea, this term um, that you've been hearing a lot, the singularity. And it's come up with regard to Elon Musk and um, Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking and others. And this idea that there's some point you know, that we have to worry about that uh, robots are going to take over and supersede us. And I want to say that everyone that I know is working in robotics and AI feels that that is very far off. We're making progress, but it's very, very slow. And so you don't have to worry about this right now. You don't think these robots are going are gonna to take over um, anytime soon. And we're talking probably at least, I would guess, 100 years um, before we see these kind of things. And, <clears throat> but what is important in the meantime, rather than singularity, is something I want to call multiplicity. And what that is, is the idea that, that diverse groups of humans and diverse groups of machines working together can actually solve very important problems. So rather than thinking of a, of a monolithic computer out there that suddenly achieves the state of AI and starts to uh, become super intelligent, what's happening right now and all over the world is that machines, diverse groups of machines, using results from ensemble theory and other statistical results, are starting to work together and combine their results in new and interesting ways. And a key part of this is using the diverse inputs from humans. So if you think of everything from Google search engine to spam filters to movie recommenders to almost any system that we use every day, there's a very strong, it relies very strongly on humans for input, for data. And I don't see that going away. In other words, if you stopped giving input to Google search engine or a spam filter, it would quickly start to deteriorate and would be pretty bad in a matter of days or weeks because it wouldn't get that constant new information from humans. So there is a very important role for humans and we have to think carefully about the idea of diversity because diversity is crucial to really thinking about how these machines and how humans will work together. And that I think is something that's very much present. That's something that we have to think about right now. So to recap, the, the future of robots is changing. It's not happening instantaneously, it's slow. The, the singularity is not that near. But the, rob the cloud is gonna provide a very important part of that new frontier of what's gonna happen in the future. And I think a part of this is to think about the multiplicity rather than the singularity. And I'll leave you with this quote from uh, Emil Cioran that is, I think, hints at this very fundamental issue of our relationship, the relationship between us as humans and robots. Thank you.
Uh, Ken, uh, thank you so much. So, um, multiplicity, not singularity. Is it frustrating for you, nonetheless, when journalists like me, when in popular culture, crazy scare stories are put out there, nonsense is spoken, and you could spend all your life rebutting that and not being in your lab researching, right? Well, yes. I mean, <laughs> we're... Um... I think it's important that that dialogue is happening. I mean, I think, for example, this uh, this event is, is specifically, I, I really like the way it's framed as a place to come together to have debates, to basically take on different opinions, different viewpoints. I think that's something that's very rooted in European culture. And we need to do more of that in the US. I think that that critical perspective, of not just taking things on face value, of not accepting these as given, is something that we need to be doing. And so when we're confronted with any of the new technologies, it's really important to be thinking about what are the consequences, what are the ways these are going to affect us, and what are the, the, the opportunities or responsibilities we have to resist technologies. 